Hello and welcome to this video on personality. Personality is at the very root of what it is to be human. Of course, animals have personalities too, but human personality plays a huge role in the prediction of many other things at work, at home, and in life in general. Personality is essentially about thinking, feeling, and doing. It is a largely heritable and somewhat immutable predisposition towards similar cognitions, emotions, and behaviors across situations and time. That is, our personalities go with us everywhere all the time. The study of personality is super important. In this video, I'll talk about personality, how to measure it, and some tips for business practitioners. Let's get started. We'll start with the Big Five model of personality. Sometimes it's called the Five Factor Model, which is abbreviated as FFM. So the terms FFM and Big Five are interchangeable. We could think of these as five different big giant umbrellas, and underneath each umbrella is a whole host of different facets or subtraits. Let's look at the first one, conscientiousness. This trait involves facets or subtraits like being careful, dependable, organized, and responsible. We can see that those are slightly different things. Careful and organized are not the exact same thing, but they're both strongly correlated with each other. It's tough to be careful, but not organized, and vice versa. In some people, they may be unrelated subtraits, but in most of us, if we are somewhat organized, we are also careful. These subtraits are derived from what's called the lexical model of personality. The lexical model developed out of the lexicon or collection of words, which is present in most languages. Researchers went around and asked people who spoke different languages and lived in different cultures and different countries, do you have a word for, say, friendly? If they were in Germany, they would say, freundlich. And if they were in Spain, they'd say, amigable which is friendly, but not the same thing as amable, which means kind in Spanish. My apologies to German and Spanish speakers. There are slightly different variations of all these words, and what they did is they went around the world, they found words with the same meaning in almost every culture that exists. There's a word for friendly in every language, so we know that those cultures use those adjectives to describe members of that culture. This is an omnipresent personality trait. These facets of conscientiousness exist all over the world because every culture has a word for careful, dependable, organized, responsible, and conscientiousness. <laughs> Let's turn to another of the big five factors, agreeableness. This is courteous, flexible, trusting, cooperative, and tolerant. These are all aspects or facets under the umbrella of agreeableness which also involves friendliness and kindness and other things like that. Then we have emotional stability, sometimes known by its polar opposite of neuroticism, which involves things like being anxious, depressed, angry, embarrassed, worried, or insecure. Next, we have openness to experience, which was previously referred to as intellectance, which sort of involves intelligence, but we should be very clear, intelligence and personality are not the same thing at all. They're probably only very mildly correlated, so they're very different things. We've come to think of the particular big five factor of personality of openness to experience as involving both being broad-minded and original as well as cultured and imaginative. Some behaviors associated with openness include being willing to live in other parts of the world, wanting to try new foods and restaurants, and an interest in cultural things like plays, books, movies, and music. Last but not least, here we have extroversion, which involves things like being sociable, gregarious, assertive, talkative, and active. Extroversion can be known by its polar opposite endpoint of introversion. If you're not sociable, gregarious, assertive, etc., then you have low levels of extroversion, which is the exact same thing as having high levels of introversion. Extroversion and introversion are one trait. They are not two traits. They are on opposite endpoints of the same spectrum. Now, we can think of the five-factor model by its acronym of C-A-N-O-E, CANOE, that is conscientiousness, agreeableness, neuroticism, openness, and extroversion.
Each of these things can be measured just with an adjectival checklist derived from the lexical model previously discussed. These checklists exist in a multitude of languages, and they ask people to what degree the adjectives describe themselves. Remember, the adjectives include words like organized, imaginative, talkative, etc. So you could use maybe a 1 to 9 Likert response scale, where 1 is disagree strongly and 9 is agree strongly. Sometimes these instruments use Likert type response scales, where 1 is not at all and 9 equals very much. Then you add up the scores of the similar adjectives that measure the same big five trait to get a sum score for each of the factors. That adjectival checklist is very useful because it is psychometrically sound and it's quick. However, it does depend a lot on the reading level of the person who's responding to the items. There are other methods of measuring the big five factors of personality. Some tests or instruments use simple phrases that can be used to describe behaviors which are indicative of the underlying trait. Much of what we know about personality is gleaned from observations of people. We make a backwards inference about the underlying trait by observing the outwardly visible behavior. For example, to measure extroversion, we might ask them to respond to items like, I tend not to say what I think about things, or I enjoy going to parties. For agreeableness, some of the test items might be like, I tend to be trusting of others. For conscientiousness, we see items like, I approach most of my work steadily and persistently. For emotional stability, they would respond to an item like, whenever I'm by myself, I feel vulnerable. You should be able to see that we are asking people about their thoughts, feelings, and behaviors, which are indicative of the underlying trait. We need to take a closer look at this dimensional aspect as I referred to it previously. I've used terms like dimensions, factors, and spectrums to describe the continuum on which the trait levels lay. Let's move on. Now let's think about these traits as unidimensional spectrums or one-dimensional lines in space. You can score low, medium, high, or anywhere in between. As with the extroversion-introversion trait, a low score on one end is the same as a high score when looking at the trait from the other end. Here are the big five noted by the acronym CANU. We have a numeric score on each trait, which represents an amount of the trait. Someone who scores a 1 on conscientiousness has very little conscientiousness or a low score on conscientiousness. They're just not diligent, perseverant, organized, hardworking, etc. Someone who scores a 7 has an abundance of conscientiousness. That is, they have a high amount of conscientiousness. They are organized and diligent and perseverant and hardworking and all of those things which comprise what it is to be conscientious. Here are some fictitious person's particular scores on the Big Five. They have a score of seven on conscientiousness. They're about as organized, diligent, and hardworking a person that can exist. They get a five on agreeableness, which puts them ahead of the scale midpoint, and it means that they're probably friendlier than most people. They get a six on neuroticism, which is probably not good, as it predisposes them to anxiety and worry. Their score is a one on openness to experience. They do not enjoy highbrow cultural activities, and they are not very adventurous. They score a 2 on extroversion, so they're really not very outgoing at all. Now we can think of two of these by their polar opposite endpoints. The opposite endpoint of neuroticism is known as emotional stability. So we can see here that a score of 6 on neuroticism is exactly the same as a score of 2 on emotional stability. High neuroticism is the same as low emotional stability. A score of 2 on extroversion is the same as a score of 6 on introversion. This is only one person's scores. What happens when we look at another person's scores? The second person's scores are in purple. Here, the purple person scores a 5 on conscientiousness, 4 on agreeableness, 7 on neuroticism, 3 on openness to experience, and 3 on extroversion. As compared to the blue person's scores, they are slightly more extroverted, somewhat more open to experience, slightly more neurotic, slightly less agreeable, and somewhat more conscientious. Let's move on.
If we connect the dots for each person, we come up with two slightly different personality profiles. As we see the profile of the blue person, we can superimpose and look at the profile of the purple person. They're very similar profiles, but they're different enough to be meaningful. Let's look deeper. For example, when you combine high levels of neuroticism with low levels, levels of openness, that may not be a real good comp combination. Such persons are likely to be narrow-minded and perpetually worried. Agreeableness is a trait which most people think would help a person get ahead. But to climb to the very top of the hierarchy, whatever that hierarchy is, sometimes it helps to be a little bit disagreeable. Highly agreeable people are sometimes simply unwilling to tell people what it is that those people should be doing. The point is that sometimes an extreme score on these traits can be detrimental to your behavior, your relationships, your thoughts, or your emotions. Here's another example. Somebody who scores a seven on conscientiousness can be fairly rigid and overly structured. Some research has found that super high levels of very specific, but not all facets of conscientiousness can predispose one to obsessive compulsive disorder or OCD. Somebody who scores a seven on extroversion tends to be so talkative and so keen on meeting and hanging out with coworkers that they may not actually get their own job done. It may not be the best thing to have an extremely high or an extremely low score on any of these traits. Let's move on. Here's a personality test that you can use with confidence. It's called the mini markers. This is the gold standard of an adjectival checklist. So the citation for this is at the bottom of the slide and you can find it in the public domain. It was developed by Gerard Saussier, again, pardon my French, in 1994. Very few words have entered the worldwide lexicon since 1994. Some slang has become commonplace in one country or another, but not in all countries. Remember that the lexical model depends on adjectives being universally used to describe personality. Here are 40 different adjectives commonly used to describe human personality in English. The response scale here is a 1 to 9 Likert type scale. True Likert scales use verbal anchors that incorporate the words agree or disagree. Likert type response scales use different verbal anchors for the scale points. To complete the test, you put your numbers in the blank next to each word to indicate how accurate or inaccurate each adjective is as it pertains to you. If you dig up the paper, you will see how to actually score it. It's quick and easy to score, it's in the public domain, and it is free. Let's move on. There's a personality test called the International Personality Item Pool, or the IPIP, available on the web for free. This has a set of particular behavioral descriptors. They're not adjectives. They're behavioral descriptors like, I never leave my home in disarray. That's not an adjective like the word sloppy, but the behavioral descriptor and the adjective can be used to partially measure conscientiousness. The IPIP items are available at this particular web address that has over 3,000 survey items. The term item is used to identify a statement or a question on a questionnaire, test, or instrument. This particular website contains some really highly technical psychometric information. If you have graduate level training in psychometrics, statistics, and personality, this is your go-to place. If you don't, and you don't want to mess up when you pick the items or the subscales that you use from the over 3,000 items, you can go to this website. This link is to a 120 item test that uses pre-selected items from the IPIP. When you answer the test online, you get an immediate score and actually quite comprehensive feedback. Now, if you disagree with what your scores are or you are perplexed and just don't understand it, you need to consult with somebody who is highly trained in personality and measurement. The IPIP is in the public domain and therefore free for users. Let's move on. There is a personality test called Cattell's 16PF, which is copyrighted and cost money. 
Cattell was a famous psychologist who helped develop something called factor analysis. Factor analysis, when originally developed, took a team of graduate students a month on hand-cranked calculators to actually analyze the data. With factor analysis, you have a whole bunch of different items or questions or even adjectives from an adjectival checklist, and you look for patterns of correlations in the data. And so Cattell came up with 16 personality factors, not the big five, but 16 as in the 16 PF, which is the name of the instrument. Some of these 16 personality factors are the same as some traits that are common to other instruments, like the extroversion, introversion dimension. What we now know from the Cattell 16 PF is that it can be further factor analyzed so as to reduce the 16 personality factors to the big five. Here's an example of one of the 16 PF dimensions, which Cattell refers to as the dimension of unrestrained versus self-control. Unrestrained is on one polar endpoint and self-control is on the opposite polar endpoint of the same dimension or spectrum. That dimension is actually just conscientiousness, noted here with the C in parentheses. For another example, Cattell refers to one of his 16 personality factors as accommodating versus independent, those two words being polar opposites of the same dimension. Well, accommodating versus independent in the Cattell 16 PF is actually agreeableness. His low anxiety versus high anxiety dimension is neuroticism. His receptive versus tough-minded factor or dimension is openness to experience. And his introverted versus extroverted dimension is, of course, the extroversion factor in the FFM. You see here five of the global factors being noted by the big five names of conscientiousness, agreeableness, neuroticism, openness, and extroversion, all with the initial of those words in the parentheses. This particular instrument has been used to great success in predicting vocational interest. Its primary purpose is to match your personality profile to predict particular jobs in which people like you enjoy the job and perform it well. The Cattell folks have accumulated a database of probably 100,000 different respondents to this inventory. They track them down and they ask them, what are you doing for a living? Do you do it well? And do you like it? Essentially, they're using personality profiles to predict job performance and job satisfaction. What they found is that people who have similar personality profiles tend to gravitate toward or find jobs that they do well and that they enjoy. For example, an introverted person is not likely to be a good match for outside sales. If they have high levels of introversion, or again, conversely, low levels of extroversion, then they're not likely to enjoy a sales job. They don't like walking up to total strangers and engaging in conversation. However, People who have high levels of extroversion tend to gravitate towards jobs that require high levels of interaction with other people. This sort of a matching of a personality to a vocation gives us a typical personality profile for a multitude of different jobs. The Cattell 16 PF has a profile for an airline pilot, for a business executive, for an accountant, for a college professor. There's a profile for every job around. However, that does not mean that if your personality profile compared, comprised of trait levels differs from the job that you are in, that you cannot do that job because your personality doesn't match it. That's not true. It does mean that people who have personalities like yours have found certain jobs that they do well and that they enjoy. This personality test is used quite often in career counseling and people who are looking for mid-career changes. It's very sim similar to the Holland Interest Inventory or the Strong Interest Inventory. Strong is the person's name who developed it. It's not like you have a strong interest, but I guess you really kind of sort of do. So there's Cattell 16 PF, the Strong Inventory, and the Holland Inventory. Thus, we have at least three personality tests that predict vocational interest, and that's really important. None of them are in the public domain, and all of them come at a price. Let's move on.
There's a personality test known as the Myers-Briggs Type Indicator, which is also not in the public domain. This instrument, developed out of Jungian psychology, that's Carl Jung, spelled J-U-N-G, which grew out of, or at least parallel to, Freudian psychoanalytic theory. This particular test, the MBTI as it is known, was developed by a mother-daughter team of non-researchers. This particular instrument is used very widely by business practitioners, and in many experts' opinion, it is nearly completely worthless. It is only slightly good for one thing and one thing only. That is, diagnosing teammate or coworker compatibility because it developed out of couples counseling therapy. For example, if you have a problem with your spouse or significant other and you go see a therapist and the therapist gives you both the MBTI and it tells you whether or not you are extroverted or introverted. Thus, you would get either a score of E or I on this. This extroversion, particular personality trait, is common to almost every personality taxonomy that there is. The five-factor model has it. The Cattell 16PF has it. The Myers-Briggs type indicator has it. I think iSync's two-factor model has it. Everybody is concerned with measuring extroversion because it's a universally recognized and important personality trait. But the MBTI measures something a little bit different than personality. It technically measures ways of interacting or ways of thinking sometimes. Its second dimension is sensing versus intuition. So sensing would involve individuals reporting observable facts through one or more of their five senses. On the other hand, people who are intuitors, if that's the right word, intuitors actually report meaningful relationships and or possibilities that have been worked out beyond the reach of the conscious mind. Ooh. Thinking and feeling are also polar opposites on the MBTI. This particular instrument says you're either a thinker or a feeler. Thinking is a reliance on the evaluation of logical consequences. Feeling is primarily based on very idiosyncratic personal and social values. Then, of course, we have the last dimension of judging versus perceiving. Judging involves a preference for using a judgment process for dealing with the outer world. Perceiving involves the preference for using a perceptive process for dealing with the outer world. The MBTI says you're either an E or an I, and there's no such thing as a fine gradation between them. You're either E or I, and you cannot have a middle score. You're one or the other. You're either S or you're N. You're either T or you're F. You're either J or you're P. The MBTI is essentially a two by two by two by two sort of characterization, which says that there are 16 personality types. There are four so-called traits that are artificially dichotomized into two levels. According to the MBTI, in a room with 17 people, two of them are exactly alike, maybe even more, but at least two have the exact same personality type. That's baloney. Personality traits, thinking modes, information processing, all of these things are best measured on a continuum. So that leads to the first of many huge problems with the Myers-Briggs type indicator. Let's move on. Never, ever dichotomize a continuous variable. When we dichotomize a continuous variable, we lose valuable information. We don't categorize all persons as either short or tall. Well, how tall? How short? It doesn't matter to a person who dichotomizes human height. You're either tall or you're short. We don't categorize age as either young or old. What's the cutoff for old? Are all persons below the cutoff automatically young? When an instrument like the five-factor model uses continuous scores, we can ascertain fine gradations and differences between people. You can score 1 to 5, or if the scale is 1 to 7, or 1 to 100, or whatever it is that the scale uh, response scale is, you can measure it on all of those points in between. The high cost of dichotomization can be visually explained with a graph. When we dichotomize a continuous variable like extroversion, and we know that we have some people on the far left tail here who might score very low on extroversion, their score may be approaching a 1. 
On the other end of the trait spectrum in the far right trail tail, we have some people who score a nine. We also have some people who score four and a five and every point in between one and nine. In this normally distributed graph, there are a lot of people who score four and five. This distribution is a bell-shaped curve. It has the number of observations on the vertical axis. So most people score somewhere in the middle of the trait scale. There are a few extreme extroverts and there's a few extreme introverts, but most people are right about in the middle. Well, if you're using the MBTI, you artificially dichotomize this continuous measure and you're either an E or an I. With this method, a, per a person who has a score of four is much more like the person who scores one then they are like the person who scored a five, just to the right-hand side of that median split. Because you split it at the median, half the observations go to the I side of the distribution, and half of the observations go to the E side. With an artificial dichotomization, scores of four and five are vastly different from each other, and scores like five and nine are exactly the same. But four and five are polar opposites. That's not true at all. If there are, in fact, 16 personality types using this dichotomization process, they can be visually charted. Let's move on. Here's the chart that lists the MBTI's 16 types of people who exist in the world. Well, what happens if you're an ENTJ and your coworker or your spouse or significant other is an ISFP? Now you're polar opposites. You're as different as you can possibly be on the four traits of the MBTI, which brings to mind a famous episode from the old sitcom television show, Cheers, where Sam and Diane were yet again trying to solve their particular relationship problems. They consult with the therapist who listens to them and says, that's it, I've heard enough. I know all that I need to know. Not only should you not be in a relationship, you should never ever see each other ever again. To which Diane replies, but doctor, doctor, what about opposites attract? To which the therapist says, ah, the cry of the truly desperate. The only thing that opposites attract is divorce. The moral of the story is that if you're using the MBTI to diagnose teammate or coworker compatibility issues, then you want people who are like you, not opposite of you, you want two people who have a very similar personality to you because opposites do not attract. It just doesn't work that way. There are other problems with the MBTI. Let's move on. There are a ton of problems with the MBTI and business practitioners are starting to slowly smell the scam when consultants push it on them. And for a high price, I might add. Scores on the MBTI are not very reliable. That is, they're not consistent, dependable, or accurate across time. You can give someone the MBTI and then three months later give it to them again, and their scores can be wildly different. If this measures personality traits as it purports to do, and if personality traits are not very mutable over time, then your personality does not change in three months or six months or two years probably. If it does change, then it doesn't change very much. If the MBTI is administered at time one, and then again at time two, within a reasonable amount of time, then your two scores should be almost identical. With the MBTI, they are not. Additionally, there's no such thing as a personality type. You can go to your average bookstore and you'll find all sorts of topics in the psychology section, not the self-help section, but the psychology section, and these bookstores are really clueless regarding personality science. There's no such thing as a type. Everybody's personality is the sum score of an infinite number of traits on which they can vary infinitely. There are not just 16 types of people in the world, yet you'll find the MBTI in the psychology section. As we now know, it is unseemly to artificially dichotomize a continuous variable. With MBTI, if you answer just one question differently. It can result in you being officially classified as either an E or an I. Answer another question differently and you could shift from a thinker to a feeler, etc, etc.
The dimensions just don't predict much, except sometimes maybe they predict coworker compatibility. Scores on the MBTI relate very poorly to other widely accepted gold standard dimensional taxonomies like the Big Five and the 16PF. They just do not match up with the science. Managers should be practicing evidence-based science, not pop psychology voodoo. A physician relies on the medical science to do their job. A manager should too. Let's move on. Here are some tips and advice for business practitioners. First, follow the science. There have been thousands of peer-reviewed scientific journal articles looking at how to measure personality, the outcomes of personality, and the antecedents of personality, which, by the way, are just mainly heredity and one's environment growing up. A chemist follows the chemical science and doesn't just put things in a test tube to see what happens. A physician follows the science when they recommend a new pharmaceutical drug or try a new medical procedure. A manager has people's livelihoods, families, and sometimes the employee's mental well-being at stake. This is a big responsibility. They should follow the science and practice evidence-based management. Second, there are different personality tests which are best used for different purposes. This is called domain specificity. Slight variations in the wording of the test items can render the test better for one domain like work, than another domain, like school. The Big Five have been shown to accurately and significantly predict job performance in hundreds of jobs, regardless of how you measure job performance. Some jobs measure performance by the number of, say, widgets a person produces on an assembly line. Other jobs, like attorneys, may measure performance by a percentage of legal cases that they win in court. It doesn't matter how you measure job performance. But it does matter how you measure personality, and the FFM is the best for predicting job performance. You should use the Cattell 16PF to measure vocational interest. This instrument is internally reliable and consistent, as well as across time. It has been validated for hundreds of jobs. It's even good for internal placement. If someone is being considered for a lateral transfer to a new position or for a promotion, it's always good to know if other folks like them have done the job well and have enjoyed the job. If you're forming teams in the workplace, you might be concerned with teammate compatibility. If that's the case, then the MBTI might work for you. However, it should probably be retaken by folks periodically as ways of thinking and modes of interaction may change over time. And that's how the MBTI very loosely claims to measure personality, that is, via those and other concepts. Lastly, get some training on the best practices for administering a personality test and especially get training on how to interpret employee scores job placement, job performance, teammate compatibility, employee mental health, etc. are all super important things and one cannot be too careful when dealing with something as innately intrinsic and as important as personality. Let's move on. Well, thank you. I hope you found this interesting. That's all for now.